What is the Brexit crisis? What is going on? The first thing that struck me this afternoon when I was thinking about it again is that Brexit is not unusual in our world. The people who are most enthusiastic for leaving the European Union have the same kinds of anxieties and come from very often the same sort of social classes as the people who are voting for Donald Trump, the people who are voting for Marine Le Pen, the people who are voting for Hofer in Austria. These are people who are quite recognizable and they have certain characteristics. Um, the Lega Nord in Italy. These are people who are protesting with a few central ideas. They're mostly older. They tend to be white. They tend to be less well-educated. They're often poorer. And they're not well-suited and do not get along well with the new technology. And I think this is true of a large majority of the UKIP voters in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, who are the backbone of the Brexit people. One shouldn't forget that 3,889,000 people voted for Brexit in, 19, in 2015. That was a big vote. That they, they only got one seat is another story I'll talk about later. <laughs> now, the Brexit movement has, in their eyes, a few causes, and they're very simplified. The thing which you hear most often is unlimited immigration under the EU. And there, there is a point. Because as long as the single market obtains the first of the four freedoms, it's precisely the right of any EU citizen to work anywhere else. And I think from the very beginning, it was clear that the EU cannot surrender this. And the question is, will the Brexit people find a way of living with it? Freedom of movement is what it is. Then I thought, how big is this problem? And I did some work on Wikipedia, which is from which much of my wisdom fl flows. And I discovered the following interesting facts. In 2014, in the United Kingdom, there were 1,528,000 immigrants from South Asia, and there were 1,473,000 immigrants from the EU. The top number on the South Asian side is 793,000, and on the EU, it's 790,000. So the Poles and the Indians from, the, um, fr from India itself are the two largest ethnic groups. Now, of course, the waves of immigration come from two quite different sources. But in the case of the United Kingdom, they do raise not dissimilar problems. The relationship between the United Kingdom and its former colonies is very complicated, and there are many citizenship laws involving who could come and when. But what I think is interesting, and is quite characteristic, is that in both cases, in the case of the EU migrants and the case of the migrants from South Asia, they constitute communities. And these communities either look different or are different or have different religions from the people around them. And over the last 50 years, the United Kingdom has literally filled up regularly with new waves of immigration, starting in the 1940s with immigration from the Caribbean. So this malaise is not new. And it's from time to time popped up. And it's happened now, I think, for reasons which are, I think are worldwide, not just British. Now, the South Asians are, of course, complicated, because they're divided largely into two completely different religious groups. There are Hindus, and there are the Pakistanis, who are almost overwhelmingly Muslim. And they live in different communities, and they often have different habits. And in some cases, the city of Leicester, which has been in the news recently for its amazing football team, is a, a city in which the majority of the population are no longer white and English. And the wonderful football team, uh, which is owned by a billionaire from Thailand who has something like 20 letters in his name, and I would begin to try to pronounce it, King Power is his company. So here you have an absolutely classic example of the modern English situation a multi-ethnic city with a Thai billionaire financing its football team who were bought very cheaply. So the situation is very, very complicated in terms of these new people. Now, what's Brexit about? The thing you hear most often, the thing which comes up in town meetings and comes up in their propaganda, is immigration cannot be controlled as long as the United Kingdom is in the European Union. And that 
is, I think, a real problem because it can't be controlled. In the case of Switzerland, the Blocher movement in February of uh, 2014 was precisely on this point. And in Switzerland, any time a pressure group gets enough votes, it can have a, a referendum, and the referendum voted to prevent free movement of people into Switzerland. The government has until February of 2017 to figure out how to work this, which they haven't yet been able to do. And with it goes the collapse of the Swiss bilateral treaties that go with it. A second thing, which is very marked in the, in the Brexit movement, is quite extraordinary falsehoods. Kate Hoey, who was a Labour MP, said in October of 2015, if we vote to leave, then the 350 million we send to Brussels every week can be spent on our own priorities like the National Health Service. That's completely false. It's 350 million a year and not a week, more than half of which comes back to the British in various subsidies from the European Union. Inequality. It's now widely said that the EU creates more inequality. That's wrong. It's the financial transformations brought about by neoliberalism and the absence of any control on income tax and so on and lowering of income tax for the rich, which has generated inequality, and that has literally nothing to do with the European Union, even though it's a source of great discontent in all the countries where these mass movements are. Negotiations are possible. They're going to have access to the single market, and there'll be no problem. We can do what the Norwegians have done, or the Swiss, or lately Michael Gove suddenly invented a possibility of imitating the Albanians, which must have produced a lot of horse laughter in Tirana. That's also wrong. The, <clears throat> whatever, whatever happens, Norway and Switzerland are caught up in the European Union's rules. If you want to have access to the single market, you have to do what the single market says. And in the case of Norway and Switzerland, you have no control over it. So those are the things which are regularly said. The politics of Brexit are, I think, what makes it unusual. Brexit occurred not because anybody needed this referendum, but because David Cameron, in a moment of his usual lightness of thought, came to the conclusion that if he stuck a promise in the Tories' party program for the 2015 election, all would be well and it wouldn't be a, a serious uh, crisis. It is now a serious crisis. It is, I think, the single most serious crisis that has happened in Britain since the end of the Second World War. Maybe the collapse of Sterling under Labour in 1976 was worse, but it's pretty close. So what you now have is a civil war inside the Conservative Party, and the people outside it, including UKIP, don't have much to say. It's between Osborne and Cameron um, and his group of people in Downing Street, and between, on the other side, Michael Gove, Ian Duncan Smith, and Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is the nearest thing the United Kingdom has produced to Donald Trump, but that's another story. <laughs> the elites, almost without exception, banking business, professions, um, people who, are, who travel a lot are all for staying in. The problem with them is that they don't really have the nerve to come out and say so, much of them. And it's not clear how much influence they have. Small business, the old, the retired, they want to leave. And in this, alas, the Labour Party historically is essentially irrelevant. It, it doesn't have a role and I think has no effect. One final factor in Brexit is really important, and that's the role of the Irish. If there is one group in the European Union who are really appalled at the idea of Brexit, it's the Irish Republic. All the gains of the last 25 or 30 years <clears throat> in the peace process, in the opening of boundaries, in the putting to rest the extremes, putting away the, the weapons, trying to get the peace bridge built, which, by the way, was financed by the European Union, the peace bridge, all that is in danger. And I was talking to the Irish ambassador to um, Britain at a, a, a meeting not so long ago, and they have the whole of the diplomatic corps in Ireland trying to make sure that the Irish go out and vote. There are over 300,000 of them, and they, are, and they have the right to vote in this thing. So they're another important group. So that's Brexit. 
Now I want to turn a little bit to the English context. I was originally struck by the idea, what is it the English can't really easily understand? And I think I didn't do it very well this morning. I'm quite trying to do it better tonight. Let's take the question of nationalism, which I didn't mention at all this morning. I remember a couple of years ago having a class that was talking about Austro-Hungarian nationalism, a state which was destroyed by nationalism. And I asked my class in Cambridge, what is your nationality? How many Scots are there? How many, how many people are there in the room from Scotland? Hands went up. What language do you speak? English. What is your nationality? Scottish. Anybody from Wales? Yes, hands went up. What language do you speak? I speak Welsh. What is your nationality? Welsh. One person put his hand up and said, I come from occupied Ireland. So I knew where his politics were. And then there were the rest of them sitting there. And I said, what about you, the majority? And all the students looked embarrassed. Because what are the English? And one of them finally said, well, actually, English. With embarrassment. And I realized at that point that the idea that the English are a nation like the Hungarians or the Poles is really alien. And it's not surprising why. The English language is universal. There are no boundaries like the Oder Neisse line, which separate one ethnicity from another in the English speaking world. Anywhere you go, you open your mouth if you're an English speaker, that's fine. So you don't run into those narrownesses, that sense of being a minority, which most nationalities do. And therefore, I think it's very difficult to establish, and it's not often said, that what is really going on here is English nationalism. Because we don't have a word for it, nobody calls it that. It is English nationalism. And it's been kicked into action by a whole series of changes, one of which, of course, is the Scottish referendum. Now I want to say something about the EU and its Catholic origins. We have to, <laughs> I heard the chuckle, but it's, it's a serious point. The EU was born out of the ruins of the Second World War. And it was born under rather peculiar circumstances. It was born in the coal and steel community, which was set up in 1950. And the coal and steel community arose from the failure of the French planners, especially Jean Monod, to get the French economy to work on its own. They needed help. And they needed help, ultimately, from the Americans and the Marshall Plan. But they also needed raw materials. And in a famous speech, Europa, Jour d'Europe, of Robert Schumann, he proposed the idea of a merging of the coal and steel assets of the Germans and the French. For Adenauer, this was wonderful, because the Germans could re-enter civilized uh, politics without having to get rid of all the Nazis who were still in power. For the French, it gave them the opportunity to have a foreign policy again. And for quite a long time, the French did the politics, and the Germans raised the money. And that was the EU. And the states which joined had their axis basically along the Rhine. They all shared mostly the Catholic religion and also the particular political form that Catholicism took, which was Catholic action, went back to pious uh, uh, Leo XIII, Rerum Novarum of 1891, the Catholic social doctrine, which was designed as a middle way between godless atheism in the communist world and the crass materialism in the Anglo-American world. So there would be a new kind of organization put together by Catholic values and a Catholic version of economics, of which one ex example is Erhard's Soziale Marktwirtschaft of, of 1953, the idea that society has to have a share in the way the market works. Now, for years and years and years, American commentators said, ho, 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 these fuddy-duddy old Germans, until 2008, when it turned out that the United States, with its completely free access to every conceivable kind of fraud, had caused a worldwide depression, and the Germans were doing very nice, thankly. Thank you, so don't hear so much of that. Now, the constant confusing in the minds of the English about this, I think, is, is really important, because they don't have a history of Catholic action. Mrs. Thatcher could never understand how Helmut Kohl could have in his quote, conservative party, a trade union movement. 
But of course Catholic action has trade unionists. There are always Catholic trade unions. In, in, in Italy, all, all the places where there are Catholics, there, are com there were communist trade unions, there were socialist trade unions, and there were Catholic trade unions. And that Catholicism gave it an identity and a cohesion which you can still find in the Karl Prize and the whole cult of the Holy Roman Empire and Aachen and the Rhine. What I, and what I think changed this was the way in which the economic boom suddenly transformed the position of Europe from a position of poverty to wealth greater than that was taking place in England. Now, the structure which was set up for the coal and steel community is basically the EU's skeletal structure today. And the flaws in the initial design, caused partly by different opinions about how much like the United States the coal and steel community should be, the court, the commission, the council, and the parliament, the four <coughs> basic structures of the EU were conceived there. And the relationship between the commission and the council was never clarified. And the authority on which the commission issues resolutions uh, directives and decisions was never clarified. And that's partly because I think Monet wanted to go further and have the United States of Europe and the French didn't want it. It bequeathed to today's European Union a real structural problem. The UK was absolutely uninterested in this particular bit of European activity. It didn't concern them. They were worried about Australia and the Empire and India and all these kinds of places. They were a world power and this little organization taking place in the Rhine Valley was irrelevant. A third factor, the European state. Anglo-Americans don't have a doctrine of the state. When I began to lecture on the state in one of my courses on Italian history, I couldn't find a decent English uh, textbook on it. What is the state? I had to get a good, there's a good Italian one. But there's no, they, they know what a state is, especially one that doesn't work. And so they write about it very fluently. But it was very hard to get English and American students to understand that there's a thing called a state. If you ask an American student what is the state, he'll tell you it's Congress or the president or something. But that's not the state. The doctrine of the state, very powerful in many European countries, especially in France and also in Germany, the idea that the state is something beyond and above the politics of the people is a very important distinction which the English and the Americans simply do not understand. So you have, I think, some very basic, very basic uh, changes. I mean, Ronald Reagan said in the early 80s, the uh, state is the problem. That's the problem. We have to get rid of the state. And that, I think, is still doctrine along there. It's also interesting to notice in this context that one of the things that the Adenauer government did in 1953 was to restore the craft guilds. Now, the craft guild is an exclusive arrangement by which craftsmen, carpenters, or bricklayers, or whatever they are, control entry into the profession and maintain quality. But it's not what Adam Smith said. Adam Smith said exactly the opposite. They're in restraint of trade. They should be swept away. And every time say the French conquered Germany in the early 19th century, they abolished the guilds. After the 1848 revolution, they abolished the guilds. Um, after 1867, they abolished the guilds. And as soon as things changed, they put the guilds back in. Because what Germans believe the economy is about is making quality goods. And quality goods are secured not by uh, uh, people who have no roots, large mass uh, factories, but in, in quality, uh, quality production. Another factor is the impenetrability of the European Union to outsiders. What exactly is it? Is it a super state? Or is it a union of states? Or is it both? Now, these are questions which may sound like political theory, but they actually matter. Who has the power and where is it exercised? The European court is a great bone of contention among the um, more cultivated Brexit people. We want to get rid of the European Court. Some of them want to get rid of the European Convention on Human Rights, too, which I think is more controversial. The European Court brings us law which is not our law. Therefore, we've lost sovereignty. 
The Council and the Commission, which is the real executive? I don't think even those of you who are experienced bureaucrats would um, take that for granted. And then there is the extraordinary thing, the Aki Communautaire. The Aki Communautaire, what exactly is it? Um, a British think tank did a study and came to the conclusion there are 660,000 pages of it, of which only about a quarter are now relevant. But what does it mean to say relevant? I have to ask you, is it common in a DG when you want to do something to see what the Aki Communautaire actually says you can do? Does that happen? And if it does it happen? No, which is what I thought. But somewhere in the Aki Communautaire, there might be something which authorizes it, DG Mare to do something about the fish core. But why is it compulsory for every state which wishes to join the European Union to sign up to the whole Aki Communautaire? By the way, where is it? In the parliamentarium. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, it's in the, it, and it, the whole of it? Nobody knows. And yet, it's a precondition to get into the European Union. You have to sign this, which is why the Swiss can never join, because the Swiss Constitution says any international agreement or any agreement with any international organization is required to be followed by a popular referendum. It's obligatory. It's, it's in the Constitution. So they can't accept. Yeah? I'm just letting you know. I mean, okay. Way. Okay, Bye. right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> English illusions about world power, I can skip. <laughs> but I do want to say a word about I do want to say a word about the parliamentary system. When Burke thought about balanced government, he thought about the executive, and he thought about the legislature, and he thought about the judiciary as separate powers, and there would be an upper and lower house. And both the British and the Americans started off with the same starting point. The Americans still have the original system, and it doesn't work, it's frozen. And the British abolished the original system and replaced it with a parliamentary tyranny, which allows 36% of the voters to get 100% of the power, without limit. A British government is the most dictatorial government in the developed world. It's a parliamentary dictatorship. But you can't tell English people that, because this British. is the... Hmm? British. What? British. British, all right. Um, I'm not sure about British. You can tell because, the, because, let's think about it. It's the mother of parliaments. It goes back to Magna Carta. It's the home of liberty. And that's why, what it is. And they don't think about the fact that it's very unrepresentative. Now, two final points. The EU seems to me to be quite unable to make propaganda for itself. Yes. It is a big organization. It has vast sums. And it's done absolutely nothing to defend itself. I was sitting there after I finished these notes saying, what would I do if I were um, in the commission? I would immediately sit down, go around to all the DGs, and ask them within 24 hours to give me at least five examples of stuff in their zone of competence which betters the lives of ordinary people. And it would be a very long list, from the Bird and Habitat Directive to various regulations on rubbish disposal, control of poisons, all that kind of stuff, which nobody sees. And uh, I, one of the people this morning um, who knew uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, very well, which has been transformed by the European Union, nobody knows it. Now, this is a tremendously important failure, and something should be done about it. So I think here that we have now a very, very serious crisis. And the serious crisis, uh, if, if I can have a minute or two just to, fin to round off, we're living in a period without precedence. The development of the internet, the explosion of liquidity in globalized capitalism, and the complete dominance of neoliberalism has produced a very odd situation. There is no world state which can control the economy. None. Whereas when Hayek and von Mises and so on developed all this stuff, of course they took the part, there was a state. There was a state which would deal with the police. There's a long section in Adam Smith about what the state should do. But who is to control the, these flows of capital? Some numbers, fresh numbers right out of The Economist. Chinese bank assets amount to 30 
trillion dollars, 40% of the entire world's gross domestic product. Chinese stock market is 6 trillion. Its bond market is 7.5 trillion, which is more than the GDP of Brazil, Russia, and India put together. The US Federal Bank is sitting on nearly 5 trillion of cash, which it got from selling stuff to the public. And these sums, and many, many, many more, are unbelievable. Asset managers, the top 400 asset managers, manage over 50 trillion of assets. BlackRock manages more assets than the GDP of the United Kingdom. And these are private companies whose only virtue, as far as I can see, is to enrich the rich and to push money around. Now, only the European Union is left, which is big enough, to tackle Apple or Google or Microsoft or General Electric or any of these. And, and if it goes, there will be nobody there. So the conclusion I want to draw is that this is a really serious matter. Because if Brexit succeeds, the EU may begin to crumble. It be, may begin to flake off. There was a recent public opinion poll in Italy when the Italians said 55%, we should follow the British example. And you can't blame them, can you? And you certainly can't blame the Greeks. So you might have a situation in which Brexit triggers a crumbling of the coherence of the EU. And when one considers, finally, what the EU offers with all its faults, in my view, the United Kingdom would be crazy to leave it. And final question, again, back to you. Why and when will the EU find a way to publicize what it does for us all? Thank you very much. <laughs>